and worship with us today.
are just so thankful for what you're doing in our church, God. And I just ask you to help our hearts and our minds be open to what you would have for us today, God. I just I ask you to help us to grasp the, the fact that you conquered death forever, God. And, and we are so thankful for that, God. Help us to be your hands and your feet and win over hearts for your kingdom, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good singing, church. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. We're nearing the end of this series. We're going to look at the first seven verses today. If you'll read it with me, I will start in verse 1. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Now I appeal to you, Yuida and Sintaiki, please, because you belong to the Lord, sell your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, we ask that your word does what only your word can, and that's change us. So help us to hear from you now. Lord, may you comfort us, challenge us, convict us, but may we experience you. May your words be spoken now, God. I pray that I speak with conviction and with passion and clarity, but it's your words that are spoken and not mine. We thank you for your love and for joining us in this place. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. I heard a story about a guy who was doing some work in his garage while his kids were playing out in the front yard, and he's doing his thing cleaning, and he can hear the kids outside, and they're playing. And then this argument ensues about red carpet or blue carpet, and they're going back and forth and back and forth. And then it was uh, the old rugged cross or amazing grace, and the old rugged cross, no, the amazing grace, and they're going back and forth. And all of a sudden, it was just like, a lot of noise and yelling, and he goes outside and sees his kids in a giant pile, like WrestleMania in his front yard, and he starts to peel kids off the pile, and they're laughing and yelling, and he's like, what is going on right here? What are you guys doing? And they said, oh, we're, we're just playing church. And uh, so that wouldn't be funny if it wasn't true, if there wasn't some truth to that, that oftentimes in church we find that there are disagreements and people fighting over things that are minor issues that become major issues when they shouldn't. And here's Paul. He's writing this letter to the church in Philippi, three chapters where he's just continued to talk about his joy and the joy that he's experiencing while he's shackled to a Roman guard in prison. And now at the beginning of this chapter, he, he, he praises them, and then he has to deal with an issue where there's these two women who are having this argument, and he's trying to uh, encourage them. Really, he's rebuking them to to get this settled, to get this resolved. And, and, uh, and then he tells them why. And, and we will uh, go through this verse by verse, but, but I'm encouraged and challenged by the text today because I think that it's something that is very real in our lives and in, in our homes and in our workplaces. And anywhere we're in community, we find disagreements and the effects of them. And, and Paul's going to give us the solution uh, for fixing it. So we look at these first five verses, and this is where he kind of lays out uh, the issue. Now think about this church in Philippi. They, Paul is 10 hours away, and he's written them a letter, and how excited they would be to get this letter. And church leaders probably called a meeting and were like, hey, we got a letter from Paul. We got a letter from Paul. You know, he's, he, he sent us this. Let's get everybody together, and we'll read it aloud so we all get it the first time. And, you know, the excitement that would be around the letter. Now, these two women show up. And one's on this side of the room, and one's on that side of the room, because that's how we sit when we're arguing with somebody. We've got a disagreement, and, and she's got her supporters, and she's got her supporters. And, and, and they might be drawn into this letter of Paul just talking about you know, having unity and having faith and, and following him and being passionate about our pursuit of holiness. And they're probably all in. And then, then you get to verse uh, uh, 2, and then he, he calls them out. And he says, now I appeal to you, Judea. And Sintiki, 
And I can't imagine the head snaps that happened when they heard their names get called out from the letter. Like, what? Did, did Paul really write a letter to our church and name us in it because of a fight that we're having? And then you can imagine the glares that started on each side of the room at each other. Like, I can't believe you told Paul what was going on. And I was like, no, you told him and you. And then it continues. But somehow Paul found out about this disagreement. And he addresses it in this letter. 2,000 years this book's been written. These two women have their names in God's holy word for a fight <laughs> that they have. And I can't imagine how they're feeling when this happens. Because these were not kind of on the fringe Christians. These weren't like back row busy bodies. These weren't like the me monsters in church that just talk about how everything is and should be the way they want it and it's all about me. Because he builds them up and he says, listen, you two got to work this out. You belong to the Lord, right? You are children of God. You are sisters in Christ. Settle this disagreement. Like, work this out. And this isn't a big issue. It's not doctrinal or theological, because he tells them, he says, listen, you worked hard with me, but you were in the trenches with me. You were on the field with me, sharing the good news. You worked with Clement, the rest of my workers. Like, you were active in the kingdom's work. You were all in. And then this, and now a disagreement? Do you, do you see what's happening, what the effects are to this? Billy Graham's wife was asked one time in an interview if her and Billy Graham ever disagreed. And she said, if two people always agreed, that means one of them is unnecessary. Hmm. Right? Disagreements are going to happen as long as we have people together. Now, Paul has talked a, a lot in, in the first three chapters about fighting for unity. And he writes in other letters that we are one body, many parts, but it's all about unity. And here he calls these two women out because of a disagreement that they're having. And he names somebody else anonymously, my true partner, whoever that is. He's like, hey, I need you to step in and help resolve this issue. Because this is not a major issue. This is a something minor that's becoming big. Here's the issues with disagreements, and we know this. So this is just a reminder of what happens when we have disagreements at church, at home, at work, anywhere we're in community with people is that the first thing is that, it, that, that, that these disagreements cause disruptions. It causes disruptions. It changes the plan of what's happening. You ever plan a day with your family, with your kids, and you got the whole day planned of fun stuff to do, and then a disagreement happens before you even leave the house? And what does it do to the rest of the day? It disrupts the plans. It disrupts the plans. And he's saying, listen, you're fighting, you're, you're sisters in Christ, you, you are in Jesus, you have this unity, let's just go back to what binds you. What binds you is Jesus. Just go back to the main thing and see if we can't get this settled. Because this disagreement is disruptive. It's, it's taken the focus off of what's most important. Because the, the other thing about disagreements are they're distractions. See, God says, I want you to lift your eyes to my call. I want you to see what I'm doing. I want you to be drawn to my vision, which is way up here. And when you have disagreements, all of a sudden, all of our visions come down. And we see the disruption, like something's happening. And now it's a distraction because now we've taken our eyes off of what God wants us to be focused on. And now we're focused on this. And the other thing about distractions are they cause division. Because it doesn't matter who's involved in the confrontation or the disagreement, there's always sides being taken. Even if we're like, well, I'm not involved in this. But every time she shows up, this happens. Or when is he going to learn that every, right, we, there's always division. It separates. And he's saying this cannot happen in God's family. This cannot happen in God's body. It may seem like a minor issue. But all disagreements have to be settled. We cannot have these things continue on. They're distracting, they're disruptive, and they cause division. The things that we're fighting against as a body of believers. And he says, listen, you belong to the Lord. Remember this. The first thing he says, you belong to the Lord. Settle your disagreement. It's Jesus that binds you. There's no disagreement. There's no issue that he, he can't enlighten, that he can't shed some discernment and get this right. If we're trying, if we're in a relationship with somebody... 
And we are not followers of Jesus. We are, we are not in this together in our relationship with Jesus. And we're trying to come to some agreement out of a disagreement. It's like trying to fix a sinking boat with duct tape. It's only a matter of time that this thing is going to sink. But if we're equally bound together by Jesus, right, he can fix anything. We just got to get our eyes back on him and remember what he did and who we are because of him and settle this. There was a survey done uh, about church attendance and, 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 and just about church life and 74 of the respondents uh, were in agreement or said that most people leave church because of a disagreement with another person. It got nothing to do with the vision of the church. It's, it's not doctrinal. It's not theological. It's, I don't, I don't agree with them. Or they don't agree with me. It, we have an issue, so I'm leaving or they're leaving. Or we've seen churches where both leave and everybody leaves with them. And churches fold up and collapse over a personal disagreement. So Paul's warning them. He's taking time out of this letter that he's penning from prison to build them up, to encourage them, to lift them up. And now he's disrupted, distracted, and trying to stop division by rebuking these women. You've got to get this settled. And he does this because he loves them and he loves the church. And he doesn't want to see this be the thing that brings them down. So he calls them out. And then he says this in verse 6. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. He said, here's what happens when we have conflict. When there's a disagreement that's going on. Not only have our, our, have our eyes been lowered down apart from God's vision, his high calling, but now we're down here, we're watching this unfold, and now we're getting invested on one side or another. He says, this, this causes us to worry. This brings anxiety into our lives. We start to focus on all the things that are going wrong, the things that could go wrong, the things that might go wrong. We start to play out all these scenarios in our mind of, of, of what could happen, though likely none of them will. We entertain them in our minds, and we allow our minds to just run with things. And you know what I'm talking about. This isn't uh, unique to them or to me. It's, it's all of us in our humanness. We let things bother us, and we worry about them, and it steals from us. This word where he says, don't worry about anything. This, you know, be anxious in nothing. This word for anxious or worry is to strangle, to choke. And that's what worry and anxiety does to us. It chokes us. It, 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 it's trying to strangle us. And you know this when you're suffering from it. When you're in the middle of it, you've let some minor issue with another person just twist you up inside. And now you can't sleep because you're thinking through all the things, and the more you think about it, the more angry you're getting, the more frustrated you're becoming, the more bitter you're becoming, and you're letting it strangle you. You're letting it choke the life out of you. And he just says this. This is a command. This is not a suggestion. He says, don't worry about anything. Be anxious about nothing. This is what he says. And the way this is written in the Greek in the original, the arrangements of the words, and, and how he's saying this command, not a suggestion. He's saying, this has to happen. Stop worrying. It's, it's, it's in the Christian life, it's, a, it's the development of a habit. He's telling them, you're worrying. It exists in your community. It starts from within. This is an inside job. We do this to ourselves. We start to worry. A seed gets planted, and we let it grow. He's saying, we have to stop it. There has to be a practice in your life that every time your mind starts to worry, you stop it. But he just doesn't leave it there. He doesn't say, just stop worrying. Don't worry. He says, instead. So he gives us an alternative. Here's what you can do. Stop worrying. Just, just shut your mind down. As soon as the worry comes to your mind, pray about everything. So worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Stop worrying. Start praying. This is the change that has to happen in our, in our life. That when worry shows up, and it does, and it will, just stop worrying and immediately start to pray. And then he gives us some illustration about this. He says, when you pray, pray about everything, tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. 
See, when we're worrying, our worry is on the problem. We're focusing on the problem. But when we pray, he's saying, focus on the provider. Change your perspective. Stop thinking about the problem. Don't let your mind go there. Don't let it do what it's going to do to you, affect you physically, spiritually, emotionally. Stop it. Start to pray and pray this way. Tell God what you need. Release yourself of the issue. Get it out. Just tell him what it is. But then, thank him for everything he's done. Start to think about all the goodness that God's poured out on you and name it to him. It changes your perspective. Because now we're not thinking about the problem anymore. We're thinking about all that God has done that's good. And the problem becomes relatively small. It, it starts to shrink back down to what it is when we start to put it into the scope and relationship to what God is doing, has done, will do for us. And sometimes it's hard when we're dealing with something that's very painful or we're anticipating something bad that's coming and it's happening, like the gears are turning in that direction, there's a bad diagnosis, there's a, a bad situation, there's this financial thing happening, and we kind of see the end of the road. It's hard in our humanness to just stop worrying and start praying. He says, unload it, give it to God. He can handle it. You're not going to burden him. Release yourself of the burden. But then thank him. And sometimes in the midst of those times when we're most anxious and we're worrying the most, it's hard to be thankful. So I would encourage you to just thank God for what you see. You could have a day, you could have a week that just has fallen apart. And you're wondering, God, where are you? Like, could anything more go wrong today? Could anything more go wrong this week? And we start to blame God for the situation, for the circumstances. And we, we start to wonder if he hears our prayers. Does he even care about us anymore? Does he love us? You have to just stop. And look around. And we might be having an issue with our spouse or with a family member. Or our kids might have caused a disagreement that's disrupted the whole day and split the family. And now this fun day has turned into nothing but arguing. And, and, and my husband taking the kids and going here. And me taking the girls. And we're going this way. And he's going. And all that. To, to lay in your bed in the midst of all of that and worrying about what tomorrow. And I was going to just say, I'm thankful that I kissed my kids goodnight. I'm thankful that I'm laying in a bed right now. I'm thankful there's a roof over my head. I'm thankful that I locked the front door that can protect me. I'm thankful for whatever. Because these are the easy things to overlook every day that God continues to give us. He continues to pour his blessings out, and we're so used to it that we look past it. But when we start to think about everything that God has done and is doing and will do for us, it changes our perspective. We see things in a different way. He can, he can change us. And in turn, he fixes the problem. And this is what Paul says. He says, instead of worrying about everything, just pray about it. Focus on the provider, not the problem. That God's giving you all of these good things. He's giving you all of these good things. And then in verse 7, he gives us this time. So... Here's your options. You can worry or you can pray your decision. But I'm encouraging you to stop worrying and start praying. And when you start praying, here's what happens. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus, which, which tells us this first. See, peace is a fruit of the Spirit. We could go to Galatians 5 where Paul writes this out. These are things that come from God. This is God's peace. It's his. It originates with him. He gives it out. It's his to give. But we cannot have the peace of God if we are not at peace with God. We can't experience his peace if we have a disconnected, broken relationship with him. It, it, I think it's in John 15 where Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. and he's, he's giving them this illustration of this is what it looks like to be in relationship with God. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Right? We can understand this. This was agricultural Culture, So we could go to a vineyard and see the vines and the branches. And the branches produce the fruit. But what's feeding the branches? The vine. What's taking care of the vine? The, 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 the vineyard owner. The, the, the person that's trimming and, 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 and pruning and doing all those things to make sure that the vine and the branches are as healthy as they can be. Because the branches are producing the fruit that the vine is feeding. He says, listen, here's the fruit of the Spirit. There's love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. You know, there's nine of them. 
but they come from God. You cannot experience them if you're not attached to the vine. And they will be produced in your life. They're God's to give. But you have to be at peace with God before you can experience the peace of God. And he says, listen, you, you can be at peace with God. Not because of anything you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Jesus says, I've, I've laid down my life so that you can be reconciled to God. That you can be found innocent. That you can be free of your guilt and your shame, of your rebellion and sin. This comes through the work of the cross, through what Jesus has done. See, we, we define peace differently in our culture, in our world. We say peace as absence of violence. So we could go to the Korean border. We could see North Korean soldiers and South Korean soldiers standing there facing each other. And we say they're at peace because their guns are pointed down. But God says, no, that, that's not really peace. See, peace is reconciliation. Peace is restoration of a relationship. This is what God cares about, relationships. And he says, I, I don't want to see you fighting. I don't want to see the division and disruption and distraction that, that these quarrels can become, these minor issues become major. Just focus on what Jesus has done for you. And that he died so that we could have the right relationship, so that I could bear my fruit in you, so that you can have the right relationship with the people around you. And you can experience peace. He says, this peace is going to exceed anything you can understand. It's beyond our comprehension. We try to figure God out in our human mind. It's all we have. But God is greater than our human mind. We go to Isaiah 55, and God says, My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So he does things that we cannot understand. We can't even comprehend them. Peace is one of them, that we can experience peace in the midst of chaos and storms and conflict, that we can have this deep-rooted harmony with God when everything around us is collapsing, and we don't understand it. I've seen this play out probably in the most visible way is when somebody's on their deathbed. Literally, they're dying, and they're a follower of Jesus. And everybody around them is broken. They're broken. They want, they're praying that this stops, that God would do a miraculous healing, that he would give them more life. And the person who's dying is like, I'm okay with this. I'm okay. You're like, I don't understand that. They don't either. It's because God's giving them this peace about it. It exceeds our understanding. But he says, this peace that you can experience, that you can't understand, you won't be able to explain it, it's visible, that we can be in the middle of chaos and conflict and, and, and be in harmony with God, and people are like, what's wrong with you? How come you're not upset? How come you're not angry? How come you're not broken? Why are you? you I, I don't know. I just really feel at peace about this. He says, it exceeds your understanding, but, but it will guard your hearts and minds. N not only does this prayer that we choose as an action, we can choose to worry, or we can choose to pray. And when we pray, God's word says, you will get my peace. So prayer brings the peace. And then he says, well, here's the peace. It exceeds your understanding, so don't try to figure it out. But what it does is it guards your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. It, it gives you a, a, a layer of protection. Because what the enemy wants to do is get into your heart and mind. And he wants to create these doubts and questions. And he wants to keep bringing up the hurts and the memories of what other people have done to you. And he wants to keep refreshing this. And he wants to, to breathe life back into them. And he wants you to be anxious. And he wants you to be worried. Because he knows if you can do that, he's taking your sights off of what God has you pointed at. And he brings it right down to here. And not only does it affect you, it affects the people around you. Now, everybody's focused on this conflict, on this disagreement, whatever it is. And he said, listen, God's peace, when you get it, it protects your heart and mind. It's like soldiers standing in front of it. They're not going to let the enemy get that real estate. He's going to try, but they're going to guard it. He's going to protect you from the root of worry. He protects our hearts, our feelings, which when we get hurt, we're in conflict sometimes because of what somebody's done to hurt our feelings. Protects our minds from our thoughts going there, allowing it to, to fester and to grow and develop into a full-blown you know, worry or anxiety attack. He said, listen, this is what God's peace does. It protects you. Protects your hearts and minds. It's a choice. You can have it. The command is to stop arguing, to settle this, and to, to, to not be anxious, to not worry. But he just doesn't leave us there. He says, here's what you do instead. This will feed you. You'll feel better. God's going to change your perspective. 
God's going God, to God's protect your heart and your mind. You're going to see that things that used to bother you don't bother you as much. That minor issues stay minor issues. And we can focus on the big picture, who we are in Christ. And we can fight for unity. Even when things don't go our way, we see the bigger picture. And we see the damage that happens when we're in disagreement. So what does this mean to us? This is a very simple text. Paul says this, worry about nothing, pray about everything. It's just a habit we have to develop in our lives. And the benefit that we receive from God is when we pray about everything. And we see his peace. We experience it more and more. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, I want to read this scripture to you. He, he addresses this because it's a problem for us. It's natural for us to worry and be anxious. And he says this in verse 25 of Matthew 6. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, right? These, these are things that cause us to worry. We're having some financial issues. We're living paycheck to paycheck. Our mind is consumed with what are we going to do next week? Do we have enough money to get us through this week? Are there, are there enough food in the cupboards? Do we have enough gas in the car with what's happening? And then he says this, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? He's saying, raise your eyes back up. You're looking at the details of your day, and I'm telling you that God's got a greater purpose and a greater calling. Isn't your life more important than food and clothes? Lift your eyes back up to God. He says, look at the birds. He says, Here's an example for you. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. You see, you're worried about things that birds aren't worried about, and they're not doing anything that you do. But God feeds them and protects them. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Jesus is saying, Did, didn't I come as, as, as the final sacrifice, as the perfect sacrifice for the atonement of your sins? Doesn't God love you so much more? He's dying. I'm dying for you, not for birds. You mean something to God. He says, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Is there any value to worrying? Does it do anything? Do we build any equity? Is there anything we can cash in and go, here's all my worry. What good do I get from it? No, it's debilitating. It breaks us down. The physical effects of worry and anxiety are bad. He says, they don't have a single moment to your life. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the food and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Do you not trust God? Are you in a place where you can't trust God with the situation that you're in? He's saying, just look around. If you want to know if God is trustworthy, just look around at what he's doing with things that are not nearly as important as you are. Things that are extremely temporary. They're here today, and they're gone tomorrow. Yet God clothed them. You don't think you're more important than a flower? God will take care of you. Do you trust him? Why do we not trust him? She says, don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. This is what people who don't have Jesus think about. They're, they're majoring on the minors. They can't lift their sights up to God and his will and his kingdom work and his purpose for their life because they have no reconciliation and no relationship with him. So they're not going to experience anything of his that's good. They're not, they're not going to experience his peace. He says, these dominate the thoughts of the unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows your needs. He cares about you. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're dealing with. And here's where we change the perspective. Seek the kingdom of God. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about those everyday things that happen that consume us. Raise your sights back up. Look up at God. Seek the kingdom of God above everything else. And live righteously. This is what Paul talked about last week. We looked at that, 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 that there's this, there should be this passionate pursuit for holiness that every time there's an intersection in our day of do I do what I want to do or do I do what God wants to do? He says, always choose what God wants you to do. Live righteously, Jesus tells him, and he will give you everything you need. 
So you don't have to worry about all these minor issues. Just worry on the one major thing. Am I doing what God has called me to do? Am I living the life that God has called me to live? Am I doing, uh, living to God's standard in everything that I do, in every role that I play? Am I doing it like God is asking me to do it? Because if I focus on those things, he takes care of everything else. He says, so don't worry about tomorrow, verse 34, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. The troubles of this world aren't going to go away. Your worrying isn't going to make them stop. We have troubles today, they can cause us to worry. We're going to have troubles tomorrow, they can cause us to worry. The choice is, do we trust him enough to give it to him? To say, God, these are the things that are burdening me right now. These are the things that are hurting me. These are the things that are breaking down this relationship. These are the things that are weighing me down. These are the things that I'm losing sleep over. These are the things that are causing me not to eat. This is it, God. I can't deal with it. I'm giving it to you. And thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the breath in my lungs right now. Thank you for whatever. Just start thanking him and watch your perspective change. Because God says, just trust me. Just trust me. Give me these things. There's no value in you keeping them. Give them to me. Trust me. We're going to move to a time of communion as we do on the first Sunday of every month. And we're going to take this little cup of juice and this little piece of bread and, 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 and we're going to sit in our chairs and, and eat it and drink it. And my prayer is that we would literally have communion with God. That in your mind you would envision it's you and him and nobody else. And he's sitting across from you at some small table in the corner of some coffee shop. And you have the representation of Jesus' voluntary giving of his life for you and for me. And we have a little piece of bread that represents his broken body and a little cup of juice that represents his spilled blood. And because of that, we can be reconciled to God. We can be at peace with God. And we can experience the peace of God because of what Jesus has done. So what are you worried about? What's got your mind right now? What's got your stomach in knots? What's just got you twisted up? Have you prayed about it? Have you battled the worry? I hope now that we can see how clear this text is, that we can develop this habit that every time we start to worry, we stop. And we start praying. And we stop worrying and we start praying. And by doing that, our trust in God will grow and grow and grow. And the peace of God will continue to fill us. So don't miss this opportunity to lay those things down in front of them. To use this, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, uh, about the Last Supper. And this is what he writes. He says, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant. It's the new contract between God and his people. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And our hope is in the future. That God is coming back, that Jesus is coming back, and he's going to restore his kingdom, and he's going to take everything that's out of order, and he's going to put it back into order. But between today and in this moment and that moment, he's telling us to stop worrying, to pray about it, to trust God with it, to experience his peace that we can only experience through Jesus. Father, as we prepare our hearts now for this time of communion, I pray that we are convicted, comforted, and challenged by your word. We all struggle with worry. None of us are exempt. Just to greater degrees. Some less than others, God, but none of it healthy. Help us not to lack faith in you. Help us to trust you more. Help us to see how much you love us, that you sent your son to die for us, that you care about us, every detail. Help us to be okay when we do pray to you and the answer isn't what we ask for. 
to continue to trust you, that your ways are greater than ours. Your thoughts are greater than ours. And you see this whole plan playing out and we only see the speck of it. And we trust you. And that we need to experience your peace, that we can have harmony with the Holy God. We can experience the calmness that comes through that right relationship. So as we come and take this cup and this piece of bread and we sit down in our chairs, may we have communion with you. May we pour out our hearts. May we hear your voice. May you draw us closer. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. I ask you to come down in the center. We have stations on uh, both sides as well as the middle. And just for traffic flow, come down the middle and up the sides. And, and give God an opportunity to work. I trust he's doing something in somebody. Respond. Thank you. Please come.
something in your heart, respond. If you're not sure what, if you feel like, you know, you need some help, you, you want to have a conversation, you need prayer, let us know. These cards go right to me. If, if it's a meeting we need to have, it's a phone call, whatever it is, let me know. I want to help you. 
If you're new or newer to the game, you just want to be in the loop of communication, I ask you to fill out the I'm ready or I'm the, I'm the new card. Fill out your contact information on the back, tear off the bottom. That's our contact information for you. But we'll add you to our text and email list. We send out you know, a couple texts a week, maybe an email or two uh, every couple of weeks just to keep you in the loop of things that are happening. But if you are newer, newer and more newer to the gates and we've not met, I would love to be able to say hi to you in person. And I'll hang out down here with Melissa and hopefully we can uh, shake hands and say hi. But I'm grateful that, that you're here. You chose to spend your Sunday morning with us. Let me give you a couple of announcements that are coming up. Next Sunday's Mother's Day. That's a big reminder for those of us that may forget. Uh, we will celebrate all of the women that God has blessed us with next Sunday. But we will also uh, be doing our child dedication. And this is really where we honor God with the blessing of children. And we, in front of God and our church and family, we, we acknowledge uh, that we've been entrusted to raise these, child, these children or child according to his principles. And for accountability purposes, we stand before you and make these vows. So if you have a child or children that have not been dedicated and you'd like to know more about that or be a part of it, you need to just text child to our texting number. It's in the bulletin. It's on the walls. Today would be the cutoff for us to be able to get the information we need to you and to get it back to be ready for next Sunday. So please do that. If you have any questions, let me know. There's going to be two meetings that follow this service immediately. Uh, there's a missions trip meeting for people that just want a little more information. That's in the community room. So if you go down this hall towards the bathrooms, towards the front of the building, the community room is on the other side of our glass entrance, on the right across from our office. You can head down there, and then our softball uh, managers, our coaches, are going to be getting some information out to you if you're interested in playing on our co-ed softball team, which will be starting in a few weeks. They're going to be in the hub uh, hanging out afterwards to, to get you that information as well. And then I want to share with you a special service that we're going to be having on May 26th called Reverberate. Uh, it's on a Sunday night. Jesse uh, came to me, I don't know, a while back and said that God had laid this on his heart to just do this type of special service of, of just kind of just just spiritual renewal and drawing in. And, and he wants to do it in the cul-de-sac, uh, which has some very interesting acoustics to it and just gathers a body out there on that Sunday night and spend a lot of time in worship and song and in prayer and in scripture reading. And this one he's themed around my sabbatical. Uh, some people know we've been talking about it for two years, but if you're newer to the gate, you, you may not know that, that I'm scheduled to take a sabbatical for June and July of this year. So after this month, and that'll kind of be the send off is this reverberate service, which I'm excited about. But if you've been in a church where sabbaticals have been taken, a lot of times it's surrounding an issue, uh, a problem, and, and this is not the case. We've talked about it in our annual meetings, our family meetings for two years uh, prior to, to now that this was planned. And just a time of, of, of some rest, if that can happen. I don't rest well. Uh, but really just some spiritual renewal, develop some strength and some spiritual principles. God would give me some renewed vision for our ministry and where we're going uh, in the future. So I, I, I ask you to pray for that time for me. Um, and says we disconnect from here for a little while. But uh, June and July is the plan, and then the send-off will be the reverberate uh, service. So I hope you'll make plans to be here for that. Let me pray as we go. Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you've been honored by this offering of time that we've given you, that we're here because we love you. Lord, maybe we're here just because somebody asked us to come. Maybe we're here and we're not sure why, but you have a purpose for it. I pray that we received it today, that we heard from you, that we were able to sing to you, to pray to you. I pray that we've been faithful in our finances to you, honoring you with everything that you've given us, our time, everything. But may we leave this place different than the way that we walked in. Help us to be people who, when we feel worry come in into our minds or our hearts, that we stop it and we immediately start praying and watch the transformation that happens when we just trust you more. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Have a great week.